732 BC. After a year-long siege of the city, the Assyrian king Tiglat-Pileser III began the offensive. With the skillful use of catapults and specific siege equipments known as Great Flies, the Assyrians collapsed the walls and entered the city of Damascus. Everyone has two homes. The first one is where he was born. The second is where his ancestors were born and lived. The earliest mention of Syria in classical literature occurs to the works of Aeschylus and Herodotus, at the time when the Greeks became acquainted with Assyria. It was a province of the vast Roman Empire. The name of Syria was formed as a result of the Greek mispronunciation of Assyria. In times past, Syria included the countries known as Aram in the Old Testament. Those were Assyria, Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and Palestine, the entire area spread over Egypt into Arabia, the Tigris, and Kilikia. The land of Syria encompasses an immense collection of cultural and historical monuments. Over time, it has been repeatedly ruled by Phoenicia, Assyria, the Hittite Empire, Rome, Persia, Egypt, Babylon, the Damascus Kingdom, Byzantium, and the Arab Caliphate. Each of them has left definite architectural tracks of their power. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the Greeks called the Assyrians by the name Syrian, dropping the A. And that's the first instance we know of, of the distinction in the name of the same people. Then the Romans, when they conquered the western part of the former Assyrian Empire, they gave the name Syria to the province they created, with Damas which is today Damascus and uh, Aleppo. So that is the distinction between Syria and Assyria. They are the same people, of course, and the ancient Assyrian Empire was the first real empire in history. What do I mean? It is that it had many different peoples uh, included in the empire, all speaking Aramaic and becoming what may be called Assyrian citizens. That was the first time in history that we have this. For example, Elamite musicians were brought to Nineveh and they were made Assyrians, which means that Assyria was more than just a small country. It was the empire, the whole Fertile Crescent. The people of Syria, together with the Mesopotamians, made up a Semitic tribe called Arameans. Little is known about the prehistoric power structure of Syria. In ancient times, each city with its nearby villages and farmlands represented an independent state. 
fabulous Damascus was one of them. For many hundreds of years, Damascus has been a constant war stage for foreign invaders, like no other modern city in the world. Damascus has been influenced by a spectacular patchwork of diverse cultures and peoples. During its existence, the city has been a witness to the passage of every historical era, starting from the Neolithic. Like any major city in the world, the present-day Damascus is also touched by new high-technology mainstreams, and yet one can still feel significance of age-old discoveries. The old city, the heart of Damascus, still exudes a spirit of historical reminiscence. It's so easy to get misled in the labyrinth of the narrow, winding medieval streets, or when walking along the geometrically exact squares of the Greek-Roman quarters. Even the stones are scarcely preserved here. The remnants of the Roman constructions, like worthless scraps, are negligently scattered throughout the old city. For many centuries, legendary Damascus attracted various cultures and peoples to itself. The fertile Barada River Valley and the Ghouta Oasis were continually visited by merchants, invaders, adventurers, and pilgrims enthralled by the fame of Damascus masters and rumors of the city's rich markets. As the legend has it, this is the land where Cain killed Abel and where the biblical king Nimrod was buried. Damascus was where the temple to Jupiter was erected and where Apostle Paul adopted Christianity. Here is the Umayyad Mosque, the largest and oldest mosque in the world, located in the old city of Damascus. Muslims considered it to be one of their holiest mosques. The mosque holds a shrine which is said to contain the head of John the Baptist, honored as a prophet by both Christians and Muslims. Eight gates gave entrance to Damascus. Today, the quarter between the gates of Bab Duma and Bab Shark is inhabited by Christians. People belonging to various Christian communities, such as Armenians and Orthodox Syrians, live here. Narrow streets twist through the depth of the suburb where proud churches of Catholic, Syriac Orthodox, and Armenian apostolic faiths rise grandiosely into the sky from among residential buildings. Halepalipo, the second largest city of Syria, is one of the ancient settlements on Earth with a history dating back more than 5,000 years. The centuries-old center of the Great Silk Road, located some 360 kilometers north of Damascus,
is rich in historical monuments. The 12th century citadel of Aleppo, erected in the place of an old Acropolis, is a distinguished example of the medieval Arab fortification art. Along with neighboring mosques, churches of different beliefs are peacefully placed on the dazzling background of the eastern city. Those shrines are revered by every Christian. A few years ago, a miracle happened in the courtyard of St. Joseph Chaldean Church in Aleppo. The statue of Virgin Mary started crying bloody tears. Countless pilgrims now come to pray and venerate the Mother of God at this site. Each Christian community, snuggled around its belief, lives a distinctive life and shares a principal goal, upholding Christianity and national traditions. The Assyrians, like Armenians and Jews, uh, in urban areas in, in particular, lived around their places of worship. We have to remember that people did not have modes of transportation other than walking, especially for people considered by Islam to be Dhimmis. There were at times restrictions on whether they could even ride a horse. Uh, sometimes if they had to ride, they were forced to ride donkeys, for example so that people needed to live within walking distance of their places of worship. So that among the Assyrians then, you had the uh, Monophysite, that is the Syriac Church, the Syriac Catholic Church, the um, Chaldean Catholic Church, and uh, of course the Church of the East, which had their community, their members, living within walking distance of the churches, so that they became somewhat um, confined to their own communities and did not necessarily have much to do with the other communities, partly because of religious uh, denominational reasons and partly because of distance. Although the language was something that they shared, uh, depending on which part of the Middle East they came from, uh, it was, and the writing system of course was the same, still there were dialects that affected uh, communications as well. Medieval Syria, the richest province of the Roman Empire, occupied the approximate area extended from the southeast end of Asia Minor to the upper banks of the Jordan, and from the northeast shores of the Mediterranean Sea to the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates. In the works of medieval Armenian historians, particularly of Movzes Khorinatsi, the Roman province of Syria was called Asurik, the Syriac people, Asoriner, and the classical Syriac language, Asoririn. So who were the peoples who inhabited this land in the early period of Christendom? As far as scholars believe, the ethnic composition of Syria in early Christian times was not homogenous. It consisted of Syrian Arameans, Hellenized people who had dwelt in these areas since the end of the second millennium BC, Phoenicians, descendants of Greek colonists, nomad Arabs, and Roman veterans.
Several small independent city-states were formed in the Roman era to the east and southeast of Syria. Aramean Palmyra was one of the prosperous city-states. Central part of Syria contains vivid green oases, with hot springs amid wind-blown sand dunes and occasional shrubs. In early Christian times, there was a famous oasis settlement, having the hot spring Efka as its only source of life. Caravans used to stop here to have a rest under the fascinating shadows of palm trees. A flourishing city gradually emerged here, later becoming the leading caravan city on the east-west route. The Aramaic name of Palmyra is Tadmor, City of Palms. The word Palmyra is a synonym for beauty. However, this description does not only refer to the times when the city reached the pinnacle of its greatness, a time when the kings of Palmyra were titled emperors, equal to the Roman rulers, and commanding the Roman legions in Asia. Nor does it refer to when Palmyra was the capital of the Middle East. The ruins of the city are still amazing with their beauty and splendor. In the second half of the third century, under the reign of Queen Zenobia, Palmyra ruled over Egypt and much of Asia Minor. Zenobia proclaimed herself empress and even considered marching against Rome, but in 272 AD, she was eventually defeated and captured by the Roman Emperor Aurelian. What followed was the sunset of Palmyra, one of the most blooming and ravishing cities of the Orient. Panem et Tersensis, Bread and Circus Games. Theatrical performances were undoubtedly one of the significant features of medieval Syrian public life. The Middle Ages witnessed a severance of ties with classical drama and a return to its dramatic folklore traditions. Stage performances spanned mime, pantomime, circus entertainments, fist fighting, and gladiatorial combats. Theater art was so developed in Syria that many of the country's talented masters acting in different stage art genres were periodically invited to Rome. There is a long period in the history of the world theater which is not researched so far. It dates back to the 5th through the 12th centuries, beginning from the collapse of the Roman Empire up to the formation of the European national kingdoms. The European literature researchers call this time period Greek Syriac Coptic, followed by the Western period Latin Celtic German. I would call the Greek Syriac Coptic period Assyrian Armenian as well, because the Armenians too belong to that period. Syria, or Asoric, as the Armenians call it, was the leader in this aspect, for since the fall of the Roman Empire, it had become the main shelter of the Roman theatrical traditions. The facts are based in the existence of the ruins of theaters, which were many in the Middle East. In Syria, there were theaters in Edessa, Jebel, Bosra, Gaza, and Sirius. I counted only five, but there were probably more. Several facts point out that the mimic theater in particular developed and prospered in Syria or Asoric. The most interesting fact referring to this is the speech of a 5th century scholar, Horicius, in support of the mimic theater. The theory on rejecting of the theater art developed even long before the early pre-Christian ages. Different speeches against theater were being written. That means the social communication system 
which was functioning before the Christian era, was outdated. While Christianity brought about a new setting of social communication, the Church rejecting the old system. The amphitheater in Bozra, one of the finest monuments of the Roman era, has been miraculously preserved in its original form. Bozra is most famous for its magnificent Roman amphitheater, which was later converted into a fortress by the Ayyubids. The original theater seats 15,000 people, and its stage is 45 meters in length and 8 meters in depth. Its acoustic design is such that all members of the audience can hear the actors without the use of any special equipment. There is a large area in front of the stage that might have been used for circuses or gladiatorial matches. Malula, it's an Arabic word meaning entrance. It's a tiny island of Christianity. with an amazingly conserved ancient Aramaic as its spoken language. Aramaic is one of the oldest languages in the world, having passed down to our days. Formed in the 9th century BC, it was primarily the language of the Semitic tribes wandering across the Middle East region. Despite the fact that the Arameans were not united and didn't enjoy statehood, the language eventually became the lingua franca, meaning the language for international contact. In the Near East and the language of diplomacy up to the times of the triumphal invasions of Alexander the Great. On the Christian side, we see another old literary form of Aramaic, so-called classical Syriac, based on the Aramaic dialect of Edessa, still being the liturgical language of some of the Middle Eastern churches like uh, the Syriac Orthodox Jacobite Church or the Assyrian Nestorian Church of the East or the Chaldean Church in Iraq or the Maronite Church in Lebanon. But Syriac is not just a liturgical language, uh, it is also the language of a very rich um, cultural and spiritual heritage of the parishioners of those churches who are mainly Arameans by origin, although they are very often believed to be Christian Arabs as they speak 
uh, uh, Arabic in their daily lives. Uh, and uh, here we come to the strongest point when we call in question the dead status of Aramaic, and that is that some of those Aramean communities not only use uh, Aramaic as a liturgical language, but also uh, as a language of, uh, as a spoken language. Uh, there are at least three so-called Neo-Aramaic or Modern Aramaic languages that still survive in isolated pockets throughout the Middle East and Caucasus. Aramaic was spoken in Syria, Palestine, Lebanon and Jordan. Today, the Aramaic spoken in Malula harks back to that ancient past. But other forms of Aramaic survive in larger pockets, mainly spoken by the Assyrians of the Middle East. The language of Jesus survives, but as the smallest Semitic language to this day. Blota, Opa, A few Christian shrines still stand in Malula, the convents of St. Thecla and St. Sergius Mar Sargis are the most valuable. According to popular belief, the defile goes back to the story of the first Christian girl martyr, St. Thecla. Converted to Christianity through Apostle Paul's preaching, she was persecuted by her own parents and chased by the soldiers of the Roman governor who wished to put her to death. Suddenly, coming face to face with the impassable mountain, she had no possible way to escape. She then prayed to God to save her, and he split the mountain, thus allowing her a provisional escape. The convent of St. Thecla belongs to the Greek Orthodox community. The convent of St. Serge and its church were built in the 4th century in honor of two martyrs of Syrian origin, Serge and Bacchus. The present Arab Republic of Syria is a unique Middle Eastern country. It has traditionally provided a hospitable environment for all national minorities, often enjoying a fraternal relationship to them. Syria represents a blend of historical monuments of various civilizations and a place where Eastern and Western cultures have met. 
Visitors to Syria can go back some 3,000 years to the times of Roman Empire or feel the breath of the Arab Caliphate. The Syrian land enshrines a wide range of holy sites with the living history of Christianity. It continues to inspire and unite people down to our days. In 1939, the League of Nations was granted permission on acquisition of territories of some 20 to 30 miles in the al Hasaka province of the French-mandated Syria. Subsequently, the Assyrian refugees from Iraq settled in al Hasaka. In the 20th century, many misfortunes and agonies befell the Assyrian nation. Beginning in the 20th century, Assyrians together with other Christian minorities living in the Ottoman Turkey were fated to endure the horrible episodes of the 1915 genocide. Having survived the Turkish Yatakhan, the remaining segment of the decimated Assyrian nation continued experiencing severe hardships and miseries. Deprived of their homeland, mountain Assyrian survivors, headed by their spiritual leader patriarch Marshimun Benjamin, were forced to forever abandon their life in the impassable mountains of Hakari. Wondering and humiliated, the Assyrian remnants scattered throughout the world. Many of them made their way through Hamadan, Iran, to Bakuba, Baghdad, and Mosul. There, they stayed under the British care who intended to use the Assyrians for political purposes. Reared in the rugged mountain environment, the Assyrian tribesmen were more than able to defend themselves and made excellent soldiers. As such, Many of them were recruited by the British authorities to form the famed special forces known as the Assyrian Levies. The Levies continues serving under the British till the late 1940s. أنا أتوراي كتولة قا أسكد ليوي دي أسكدين دي تقنسناي مرا لازم مرفوتون كسياثة وخو بطلوتو مسكرية ليني مرضول ليني شرطيني بلوتو مسكرية تقنسناي مبار فلتلا طلب لي من باتريركا مرئي شاي نورا صندوقي تشد لي قريشة عاميدية رئيس مختاري وملكي وجوراني تأتوراي مرا أخني ليش الغيو أفرت عراق لازم طلب شرطا وفي الخانة تاخني الخيمة تعلم بيتها يو إراق أنا إيمان جميلة قريش تاميدية كثولة أسرى شرطة ميرا من دي قمايا أصي ميديا هويا دهوك مباثر أصي مي مثيلا مدرسة مقرأ تريلي شاني أربية وإنجليز ومبار هادخ ما مري أمراني تاويلا أمراني the unsettled question of Assyrian autonomy in Iraq, political games, and the tension between Assyrian and Iraqi nationalists eventually boiled over into open fighting. The outcome of this fighting was the horrific massacres of northern Iraqi Assyrians by the Iraqi National Army units in August of 1933. After the period of British patronage ended, 70,000 Assyrians made a request of receiving land loans in the places of their residence. But Baghdad re reacted with hostility to the natural and modest request of the so-called ungrateful Assyrians and intensified its oppressions. 
and the English authorities, who did not need the Assyrian services anymore, abandoned them, leaving this nation to the mercy of fate. Moreover, turning their back on their former allies, the British left them to the regressive Iraq that did not fall to get even with the Assyrians organizing their massacres. On July 18, 1933, the Assyrian spiritual leader Marshimun became an undeser undeserable person in Iraq and had to leave for Cyprus. Here he raised his complaint against the British disregard. In response to that, the British again began to drive a wedge among the Assyrians, Kurds and Arabs, trying to resolve the Assyrian question, totally exterminating the latter. In late August 1933, when thousands of Assyrians were trying to move their families to Syria, zone of the French patronage, Iraqi authorities used armed force against them on the bank of the river Tigris. The Iraqi authorities aimed to disarm the Assyrians, but they refused to obey the directive to lay down their arms based on credible fears of harm. The Iraqi government had devised and intended to implement a plan for the disarmament and deportation of Assyrians from the region. As a part of the operational phase of this plan, the Assyrians living in the village of Samel and its surrounding areas were brutally butchered by the Iraqi army. In a continued wave of destruction, the Assyrian settlements in northern Iraqi regions of Ahmadiyya, Sako, Dohu, Sheikh Khan, and others were swept away by the violence. Meanwhile, the Iraqi mass media engaged in a propaganda campaign blaming the Assyrians for perpetuating a war against the Iraqi people. August 7 is another bloody page in Assyrian history known as Qutlop, Semeli, or Semeli massacres. Every year on this day of mourning, the Assyrians commemorated the sacrifice made by the Assyrian martyrs and pay tribute to the victims of the genocide. Assyrian villages on the Khabu are comfortably situated along the river by the same name. Refugees from northern Iraq have settled here according to the region of Hakari, to which they originally belonged. Hakari province is situated in current day Turkey. Today, <laughs> Members of the original five semi-independent Hakari mountain tribes, Upper Tiari, Tchuma, Jilu, Bas, Andes, 
still make up the majority of the Khabur Assyrians. Tribal identification seems to remain strong among these Assyrians. Practically everyone is able to identify the particular tribal affiliation of the neighboring villages. Until the 1940s, Assyrian refugees were not granted Syrian citizenship. However, in time, a dam was constructed over the desert lands and water pumps were set up. The first irrigation dam was placed on the east bank of the river. Assyrian migrants cultivated the desert lands, grew vineyards, fruit trees, cotton, and wheat. However, not every settlement succeeded in farming. The general lack of water and scarcity of annual rainfall forced the people to move to larger Assyrian settlements and even to Lebanon in search of jobs and a better life. The Assyrians today make up about 20% of Tel Tamar's urban village population. The Assyrians of this bustling little town, the largest of the Khabur settlements, are mostly clustered around the high ground near the banks of the Khabur River. In the 1960s, Tel Tamar was an entirely Assyrian inhabited community. Now it has only 350 Assyrians. Most current Tel Tamar inhabitants are either Kurds or recently settled Arab Bedouins. Since the Assyrian resettlement in the Khabur, the first state school was established in Tel Tamar. Later, this was followed by the construction of the hospital. In Tel Tamar, the Church of Our Lady, completed in the early 1980s, still serves as the center of the Assyrian community. Some 500 meters away from the new church stands a large green domed brick mosque, built in the 1970s to serve the growing Muslim population. It's been two years since the Assyrian Association started its mission in Tel Tamar. Prior to this, any activity by a national organization in Syria was strictly prohibited. The center of the Assyrian Association is still in Tel Tamar, although many branches are in operation in different Habur villages. The organization aims at supporting poor families, and in particular, young people and students. Construction of sports clubs, and purchase of an area for the new headquarter are the plans of the association for the nearest future. The association includes members not only from the Church of the East, but also from the Chaldean and the Syriac Orthodox churches. Khabur Assyrians boost the local economy by owning small businesses in the region. Local entrepreneurs run a livestock farm near Tal Tal village, where cattle, sheep, and goats are bred mainly for sale purposes. Some businessmen have set up halls to be rented out for different events. Restaurants, hairdressing salons, various kinds of shops and green groceries are densely lined along the narrow village streets where life is filled with lively trade. It seems that pyrotechnic products are the best-selling commodity these days. No wonder. The new year is coming up and there will be plenty of firework displays on the streets during the holidays.
It's a New Year party in one of Tal Tamar's clubs where the local youth has gathered. It's encouraging to see these beautiful and promising young people as the pledge of the future of the nation. The searing music and songs are being performed by a local band. knows how to dance the Assyrian national dances in a lively manner. Work will soon begin anew in the fields and the people of Khabur will return to their routine village life. Somewhere construction is underway, elsewhere someone is getting married, while another is preparing to leave the village for good. Somewhere a life is ended on this earth, while in another corner a new life is born. That's how life goes on, that's how these people live. For those leaving their villages in Khabur to go abroad, life is not simple. Homesickness takes a heavy toll on them. Some, unable to cope with its consequences, return to their native home in Khabur. I have been living in Germany for the last 20 years. Then I decided to come back to Syria, my country, where I used to live in Tel Tamer. My wife and kids are still in Germany. I decided to come back because I realized that it is better to work for one's country than to work for a land where you are a stranger. Here you can find employment and you can work for your living better than you would in a foreign land. In Germany, it is expensive to live, but here you can live with a less of a financial burden. Here you are among your own people. You can live with them, walk with them, and talk with them. But in Germany, you are a stranger. You don't know the language, you don't know the people, and you cannot live with them as you do with your own people. I invite all compatriots to go back to their homeland where they have been raised and where it is their ancestral home, and where you will always remain Assyrians, you and your generations to come. Every first Wednesday in January, the Tal Machas villagers begin preparing Murtucha at 6 a.m. Murtucha is a blend of oil, flour, and salt baked on the hearth. It is given to every resident of the village, but the first share, according to the tradition, goes to Khabur's barren women. Three pieces of murtucha have been already put aside. According to tradition, when tasting murtucha with faith, the barren woman will be able to bear children. As we were told by the villagers, this tradition was primarily popular among the Jilu Assyrians, but it has already been many years that the people of Tal Mahas, originally of Hakari's Gawar district, follow it. At one time, Sharad Sliva, or Feast of the Holy Cross, was largely celebrated by the villagers of Marzaya from Hakari's Jilu region. Such festivals were accompanied by traditional music and dances and gathered many people from the nearby Ashiras. Marzaya, one of the most revered saints of the Assyrian Church of the East, passed away on the first Wednesday of January in 1431 AD. Murtucha is prepared every year on this day. Mal 
الكد ملكي او رغلشنا ودهولي عشنا لا ونزا يا مارد خاطب نسخاني نهوي عيد بريخ عليكم وكريستياني وثهو نرخيمي عيني ملكي عبدياني service on the occasion of Murtuha is celebrated at the church in Telmachas. Marzaya's hagiography reveals that the saint lived and preached in the Jilu region together with his disciple. A Hamananes church stands in Jilu where Marzaya's relics repose. The large village of Tel Hormiz on the isolated west bank of the Chabur is the stronghold of the ancient Church of the East, which is based on the old calendar. Seated in Baghdad, Maradai is the patriarch of this church. It's January 7 today. Sticking to the old calendar, villagers of Tel Hormiz celebrate Christmas on this day. It's a Christmas liturgy. The church of Raban Pithian is crowded with believers from Tel Hormis and adjacent villages. <laughs> The settlement is made up of some 150 Assyrian families today. All of them are descendants of Assyrians from the Tahuma Ashirat. The people here are fortunate to have land plots with a sufficient supply of water. Vineyards, orchards, and agricultural crops planted by Assyrians still remain in this area. Tel Hormis winemakers are famed in the region. Over the past years, the Habu River grew shallow, causing massive damage to the villages being irrigated by it. Many fields, once fertile and flourishing, are waterless now. Only grain can be grown there. Many Assyrian villages gradually become deserted as the people move either to the cities or foreign countries. Arabs who settle down in this region cultivate the Assyrian-owned land plots. There are only some three to four Assyrian houses in the settlement of El Makhadda. This is the village of Tel Goran. Only 15 Assyrian houses remain here. As we were told by these children, the village school offers a seven-year education. Unfortunately, the graduates cannot afford to continue studying at other schools. Children run across the village and play games. Girls, having finished a seven-year education, have to stay at home and do housework. Such a lot is common for every girl of this region. Few of them succeed in studying in Aleppo or Damascus. Many of them get married and start a new family life. Many Assyrian men choose Habur girls as wives. A considerable number of Habur Assyrians have relatives in the United States, Sweden, and Australia. All the villages have churches, and each year sees another of the original mud brick structures replaced by sturdier cinder block ones. A new church is under construction in the village of Deltaville, or Bene Runta, as it's called here. 
It's the outermost settlement of the Assyrian villages along the Habur's west bank. This magnificent temple of Mat Maryam in Tel Nazri was built a few years ago. Since not every settlement has a priest, Kasha Givargi's David serves in Tel Nazri as well as the neighboring villages. History records a number of cases when Muslims have revered Christian saints and holy sites. This Arab man, leaving his shoes at the entrance to the shrine, has modestly taken a seat at the end of the hall, venerably following the evening service. At school, classes on the mother tongue and sacred writing are carried out by a clergyman. The village church committee of Tel Nazri is one of the most active and organized in the Habur. Many churches bear the names of the Hakari traditional shrines. Tel Hafian has Marshalita. Marshalita was the saint of the patriarchal church in the Hakari village of Kochanis, where the villagers of Tel Hafian originally came from. Hard life and unemployment make large numbers of Assyrians move to the neighboring cities of El Hasaka and Kamizli, where many of them take up permanent residence. This is how the Assyrians call the Syrian city of Kamishli, situated near the Syrian-Turkish border. After World War I and the genocide of the Armenian and Assyrian people in the Ottoman Turkey, a number of Armenians and Syriac Orthodox people from the Turabdin region, the cities of Mardian, Diyarbakir, and Urfa, found shelter in the Kamishli region. Present-day Kamishli is one of the large and developed cities in Syria, even boasting an international airport. This is the Christian quarter of Kamishli with narrow, meandering streets, high buildings and imposing shrines. The largest communities are the Syriac Orthodox and Armenian Gregorian. The city has also communities of Chaldean Eunates, Catholic Syrian, Assyrian Church of the East, Catholic Armenian and Protestant churches. The Assyrian Church of the East community 
totals an estimated 150 families, of which 20 follow the old calendar of Maradai Church. They live in this part of the city. At one time, predominantly Assyrian studied at this school. Now it has many Kurdish students. Along with the state curriculum, Assyrians study their native language as well. During the summer holidays, the churches carry out classes on Assyrian and sacred writing. The Assyrian Church of the East, named in honor of Mara Prem, offers sport classes and music training for the young people in Kamishli. There are some 500 Syriac Orthodox families and four Orthodox churches in Kamishli. The city has a school with a state curriculum and classes on Syriac language. The folklore school with Urhai dancing lessons is in operation in Kamishli. The school has different age groups. These are the Urhai students demonstrating Assyrian folkloric dances. They took the first place award in the dance competition at the festival held in Damascus in 2005. Assyrian Democratic Organization Mtakasta, one of the Assyrian political parties, launched its mission in Kamishli in 1957. The conception of political movements with such patriotic flair was based on the emergence of a national ideology inspired by prominent Assyrian leaders such as Naum Faik, Freydun Aturaya, and Ashur Joseph. Mtakasta founders, made up of representatives from the Syriac Orthodox and the Church of the East communities, had an ideology based on creating a unified Assyrian nation irrespective of denominational affiliation. The organization aims at serving the nation dutifully. The Mtakasta members and supporters around the world launch business programs and make investments to boost the small and mid-sized businesses in Kamishli. Those investments are intended to benefit the Assyrian people. They purchase commercial properties and residential buildings. The city has four hospitals today, all established with Assyrian funds. This cannery elaborates and exports a variety of fruits and vegetables. Transport companies such as Isla and El Rafadiye organize bus trips from Kamishli to Damascus, Aleppo, and other large Syrian cities. Near Kamishli, there are villages where followers of the Syriac Orthodox Church reside. These settlements were established by the Syriac Orthodox people from several areas of the Turabdin region shortly after the 1915 genocide. Today, many of those villages become deserted as the local residents move to Kamishli or to foreign countries. Only 12 houses of Syriac Orthodox followers remain in Dimhia village. Local population has gathered for the morning service celebration at the 5th century church named in honor of Mar Akho, one of the most revered saints of the Syriac Orthodox Church. Despite a decrease in parishioners, the priest faithfully continues his service before God and the flock. Thank you.
most members of both the Assyrian Church of the East and the Uniate Catholic Chaldean Church in Syria are still centered in north and northeast regions of the country. Tel Arbosh is the sole village of the Uniate Catholic Chaldeans. It contains St. George's Chaldean Catholic Convent, which currently has three nuns in residence. The kindergarten run by the congregation is attended by children from the Chabur settlements. They stay here till noon, playing, drawing, and learning to recite and pray. After their day is done, they are taken home. The Assyrian Democratic Party, founded in 1977 in Habur, was born out of an emergence of nationalistic ideas. It was born out of the need to address the past tragic episodes experienced by northern Iraqi Assyrians and to pay tribute to the victims of the 1933 Semel massacre. The party's ideology is partially based on the principles of such outstanding Assyrian figures as Mar Shimun Benjamin. Freydun Aturaya and Ashur Joseph. One of the goals of the ADP is creating political stability in the region, which will strengthen the nation and promote the rights of the Assyrians. The party provides medicines to the Assyrians living in northern Iraq and supports the Assyrian students. The ones who study in Aleppo are the members of the ADP-founded Youth Council of Mar Narsai. As a result of the gradual move of Assyrians to al Hasaka, the center of the al Hasaka province, the urban population has drastically grown within the past decade. al Hasaka comprises close-knit communities of the Assyrian Church of the East, Chaldean Catholic, Syriac Orthodox, Syria Catholic and Evangelical Churches. Evangelical Congregation is made up of former members of Assyrian Syriac Orthodox and Uniate Catholic Churches. As far as the sources reveal, the Chaldean Assyrians in 1993 amounted to 30,000 of which 12,000 represented the Catholic Church. The census of 1994 shows that an estimated 19,729 Assyrians lived in 31 settlements of the Habu region. Like most places in the Middle East, the Muslim population in the Jazeera has grown much faster than the Christian population in the last 20 years. In 1995, the Assyrian community in al Hasaka contained some 500 families. Assyrians, yet again having survived extermination in the second half of the 20th century, found shelter in the Habu region. Life of those people, who vivified the wild steeps of Syria, was centered on their families and churches. Secluded life continued in Jazeera up to the 1970s. Today, the number of Assyrian villagers in Habu has dramatically decreased. Somewhere overseas, the Assyrian communities are being replenished by compatriots from Syria and other Middle Eastern countries. Their history goes on. Their life goes on. 
New times dictate new rules. The Assyrians enter a new age, leaving behind the horrible tragedies of the past. Through the corridor of time still echoes a question posed by an Assyrian in Hamadan. Having fled the massacres of 1915 in Urmia and having been fed on only snow for three days, he asked the captured Turkish general, why don't we have homes anymore? There's an old parable common among the Hakari Assyrians that states, there's a place where there is birth but no burial, and there's a place where there is a burial but no birth. The Orient, the birthplace of human culture. The first clause of the Hakari parable is reminiscent of the struggle for the survival of human ideas, a place of birth, but no burial. The glorious mountains of Hakkari are left behind in modern day Turkey. That area of the world is now the hottest spot in recent history. The bitter memories of the new generations of Highlander Assyrians are intertwined with Hakari, where their ancestors once lived. Every nation has its stories and legends, riddles and fables. Sometimes they have analogous meanings, but differ in form. They are popular among common people and are passed on from generation to generation. Ordinary people are similar irrespective of race and religion. Thus wisdom is universal with no homeland and nationality. Riddles, parables and legends were largely popular in the Hakari Mountains. The folklore was essentially based on biblical themes Many of these traditions still exist in the tiny Habur settlements. The Habur people of Hakari origins still bear many parables, anecdotes, and fables in the corners of their memory. <laughs> Fairy tales are afterglows of the childhood. They embody the struggle between good and evil, where the former always achieves triumph. Ten-year-old Nisha maintains her ancestral traditions. Besides recounting the well-known fairy tales, she also creates new ones. Nisha is now trying to tell a fairy tale to her brother, but he's obviously not very interested. In contrast, Ninos and Eptisam, the parents of Nisha, are always ready to listen to their favorite daughter. In most of her fables, the heroes are animals, each of them personifying a certain human character, evil or kindness, slyness or wisdom, bravery or cowardice. Ifa <laughs> 
انقتلنا اي بيش زنجل زنجينا قبل قبل ايون ايونا رشلة بيو انو باي قتلنا قبل رقلة 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 عين براخة اقا عون بارو The close-knit life of the Khabur Assyrians and their isolation from the outside world guaranteed the continuation of language, culture, and a mixture of traditions which existed in their native mountains of Hakkari. During his lifetime, Mukhtar, the former chairperson of Tel Hormis village, has gathered the well-known proverbs of his tribesmen. National wisdom is carried to the future generations from fathers to sons, from century to century. The Khabur Assyrian woman is considered to be devoted, skillful, and diligent. The whole burden of the household falls on women. A Syrian woman is highly moral, hardworking, and devoted to her husband, wrote researchers. The most sacred work for Assyrian women is baking of lavash, thinly rolled out dough baked on tanura walls. Tanura is a clay-coated pit where fire is kindled. With this archaic instrument called jarusta, the Assyrian women mill wheat and other cereals to prepare various dishes of grinded grains. This instrument called khashulta is for grinding oats. It's a hard task to be done by women. That is why exclamations like these need to be let out to muster up strength during the process. Khabur people are very hospitable. A visitor cannot walk past a house. The master will get offended. Here, people respect anyone who crosses the threshold of their house. Vardiya's household is small, but extremely clean, where everything's in its place. The table is laid with traditional Assyrian meals, chipte and kabebad. Today, harissa is the centerpiece of the table. It's an oriental dish prepared of cracked wheat and well-cooked chicken. Harissa is mostly made on religious holidays or feasts of saints. Dekhva is one of the traditional dishes of the Hakkari Assyrians. It's made of mutton, dry buttermilk, and grinded oats, and is served up mainly on holidays. In the traditional lifestyle of Habur, a family may have at least five children or more. However, the new generations view life from more modern perspectives. Extended family of Dadishu has gathered together today. In its head, the grandfather is surrounded by his sons, daughters-in-law, and grandchildren to celebrate New Year 2006. Sava Daniel, getting a little tipsy on his favorite drink, Arak, 
started telling jokes and anecdotes about the Hakari Highlanders and the Urmia Assyrians. The emotional outburst of the Highlanders, sons, is on full display, especially on New Year's Eve. They are as soldierly, as energetic, and as loud as their ancestors. From the earliest times, Assyrians have had a rich collection of folk songs. Many of them have passed on to our days. Despite her declining years, grandmother Yonia from Tel Nazri village has an impressive and sonorous voice. Oh, <laughs> 
With a profound tremble, she performed a patriotic song called Nishra di Tchuma, the Eagle of Tchuma. Like many old people here, she remembers almost every national song and hands them over to the next generation. Khabur is rich in talented musicians. Ninos Oshana, a well-known songwriter, performer, and musician among Assyrians, plays eastern string instruments such as oud and tambura. His songs are composed of patriotic, lyrical, and love tunes. Lifestyle, philosophy, belief, and tradition are reflected in national costumes where each detail has its meaning. A peacock feather was used to decorate the hat of the hero who had defeated the enemy. The vest was used for the local cold climate and had a protective purpose. Clothing was usually made of wool and cotton, shirts and underpants of cotton and velour. Shirt sleeves called lavandille were long flowing handkerchiefs, and pants, shala, were covered with embroidered traditional patterns. Such patterns could be seen on wool socks as well. The shoes called charuje were made of leather and wool and worn by Assyrian men. Silver adornments were largely used on women's traditional costumes made of velour. The women also wore silver decorated headdresses, breasts, and waistbands called hiasa. Women also wore sharuje and wool socks. Step by step, the idea begins to take on form. A dance is a reflection and reproduction of the history, culture, and philosophy of the people. The dances reflect a part of the people their attitudes toward life and their traditions.
Khoshaba, a person famed because of his traditional national costumes, symbolizes an Assyrian Highlander living in impregnable places. Those who remember him confess that little has changed in his appearance over the years. Though he is not young, his performance of the Assyrian dances is spirited and full of life. In this way, he passes on to the next generation the philosophy of the dance which embodies the ancestral traditions. Dimdima, as we were told by Khoshaba, is an old dance coming from pagan times. It shows how Assyrians captured a Persian fortress, paying for it with their blood. The name of the dance is derived from the word dimma, meaning blood. As far as research shows, dimdima symbolizes a struggle between a shepherd and a pack of wolves. Seppa and Matala, or the sword and the shield, is a winner's dance. It was performed during the triumph over the defeated enemy. Men armed with swords and shields made a victorious round dance together with women. Group dancing, performed by the entire village. That's how these dances were characterized. Today, it's the same way. As long as the Assyrian song and dance lives on, even in a tiny settlement in Khabur, where Khigit Yamat is accompanied with the inspiring sounds of Zurna and Dabula, the nation will live on.